All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining. Uh, my name is Peta. I am a part of the team that works with custom information systems. Uh, we put these educational uh, webinars on, uh, you know, about once a month or so. It's a series that we have ongoing. Um, Tim and the, the CIS team, this is something that they're very passionate about. Um, that was Tim there waving uh, cybersecurity and keeping businesses secure. Um, you know, that is just something very near and dear to the to the CIS mission and and you know that's the purpose behind these educational webinars that we put on on an ongoing basis. Uh, but today we've got a special guest, uh, Jason McNew. He is uh, one of our cybersecurity experts, and he is going to be leading the presentation today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jason. Uh, thanks, Peter. You can hear me okay. I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about my background. My name is Jason McNew. I live uh, near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in an old farmhouse that was built in 1760 with my four kids. I'm a veteran of the United States Air Force. I spent oh, 10 or 12 years at the White House Communications Agency, and a bunch of that was at uh, Camp David presidential retreat. I held a presidential access clearance during that time, known as Yankee White. In 2017, I founded a small consulting practice called Stronghold Cybersecurity. We were working mainly with Defense Industrial Base doing this and CMMC consulting. And educationally, I have a master's degree in information science and cybersecurity information assurance from Penn State, in addition to a couple of other degrees. Tim? Uh, my name is Tim Riddle. i the president and founder of Custom Information Services. I founded the company in 1989. Uh, started off actually implementing ERP systems, got a strong accounting background. Uh, we've been performing managed services since about 1995, and we expanded into uh, managed security services in about 15 years ago before it was really popular. It's just one of those necessary things with our customers. Uh, our focus is on the, the business strategy for our clients and help them both go through their infrastructure and security needs, as well as their uh, uh, business uh, management consulting needs as well. Okay, uh, so get started here. Uh, 1998, don't get in the stranger's cars, don't meet people from the internet. 2017, literally summon strangers from the internet to get into their car. We're talking about Uber and Lyft here, of course, and this looks funny. And the reason why I bring this up is because it, it shows to us that not only has technology advanced radically in the last uh, in the last 20 years, Tim and I were talking about the Y2K bug uh, before we got started on, you know, remember the modem dial up days and all that. But it, not only is the technology advanced radically, but um, our culture has changed a lot, too, and attitudes towards security and privacy are very different between uh, the various generations, whether they're uh, you know, boomers or Generation X or millennials or Generation Z. And that's something that has to be taken into consideration when we think about uh, the business of cybersecurity, which I'm going to talk about next. What is cybersecurity? And uh, this is sort of a, you know, a canned definition. I'm going to kind of read this. Cybersecurity is the body of technologies, processes, and practices designed to protect computers, handheld, and other internet-connected devices, networks, programs, and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. And that sounds great. This is a definition that you might have to learn for a, uh, you know, for a college course or from a certification. But cybersecurity is the business of managing risk. Cybersecurity is a cost center. Um, for most businesses, it's just one more ball in the air that you can't drop. And it, it really only makes sense to the extent that it reduces your business risk or it saves us money in a way that we could quantify mathematically. Uh, this is our agenda have a couple of things we want to talk about over the next 45 minutes or so, and I try to chop things up into about the thirds. Uh, third. So we're going to talk about the cyber uh, the cyber threat landscape uh, and the small to mid-sized businesses. We're going to talk about advanced protective technologies like SIEM and MDR and some of the things that you need to know. And then finally, we will talk about the importance of security risk assessments, cybersecurity risk assessments specifically. The cyber threat landscape. This side, uh, look at this chart. We all love charts, don't we? But less than 7% of the world's internet users are actually in North America. So that's the United States and Canada uh, for the most part. 
And most people are surprised when I show them this. Most of uh, the world's internet users are actually in, in Asia, Europe, and Africa, which, and when you stand back, that stands to reason because that's where most of the world's people are. That's where the world's most populous regions are. So that's where the uh, most of the world's internet users are. In, in spite of that, look at this pie chart, internet uh, world penetration rates by geographic regions for 2021. Despite the fact that North America is only 6.7% of the world's internet users, 93.9% of the attacks are on, on North America anyway. And you have to stop, well, why is that? And think, you know, you think about it, um, there's an old saying that, you know, all, all roads lead to Rome. And these days, all, Rome, all, all roads lead to, you know, the West, to America. And, our, our entertainment, uh, technology, these things that we're exporting to the rest of the world. So when people in other parts of the world turn on TV, what do they see? They say Baywatch or, you know, everybody has big houses and they have beautiful families and nice cars and, you know, the problems that they have are trivial. So that's how people kind of view the world and these other view that, uh, you know, America and the West, frankly, uh, from other parts of the world. And that shapes their, their perception. And that's what it has. A, it drives a lot of what's what's going on. In terms of ransomware, ransomware really is just good old-fashioned robbery, pretty much. It's like robbing a stagecoach or robbing a train, and you're going to try and rob the easiest target that you think has the biggest bags of gold, pretty much. So that's why they're after the SMBs that are in, in the United States and in Europe, Australia, uh, South Korea, you know, the, the developed world. Uh, well, remember this. This is the Soviet Union, you know, juxtaposition, uh, juxtaposition against Europe. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because for uh, for all of its other failings, the, what we now call STEM, science, technology, education, and engineering and math, education in the former communist bloc was actually pretty good. Uh, you know, you, we can't forget that Russia put Yuri Gagarin in space in 1959, but before, before we did, they did it at great, great risk. Um, and and uh, their education, that, that is still true in Russia, Eastern Europe, countries like Belarus, Latvia, uh, Poland, uh, their their STEM education in in primary school is still very very good, and their kids are a couple of years ahead of ours, um, two three years ahead of ours in in math. So you have, you know, a section of the world where people are well educated in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, they're hardly dumb. They are not dumb by any stretch. They have a lack of economic opportunity, uh, and not only that, they take advantage of jurisdiction. So. In most of the developed world, there are legal prohibitions against hacking both inside and outside your borders. Uh, United States, Canada, Australia, again, places like that. You use an Australian citizen or an American citizen. Um, it's illegal for you to hack either inside or outside of your borders. You can get in trouble for that. But not every country is like that, specifically Russia. In Russia, it is illegal to hack with inside Russia. And I believe it's illegal to hack some of their allied countries. But it is not illegal to hack Europeans or Americans or whatever. So the, the authorities aren't going to do anything. And the same is true of a lot of Eastern Europe. So if you set up a ransomware shop in Belarus and you're targeting Americans, the local authorities there are not going to do anything. They, they don't care as long as you're not targeting the wrong people. Um, so there are a number of uh, things, you know, historically, um, geographically, geopolitically, culturally, economically that are contributing to this massive problem that we have. It's very complicated and its roots go back, you know, frankly, to the Cold War. So SMB, small to mid-sized businesses are targets and the gap between the number of breaches seen by small and large organizations is really shrinking. And again, let's go back to my stagecoach and tra train analogy. If you're gonna rob a stagecoach, you're gonna rob, rob a stagecoach with one gun on it or with five guns, right? Uh, that's what the SMBs are. They're not well defended. Enterprise, they tend to be well defended. They have big budgets for cybersecurity. So uh, the low hanging fruit tends to be the SMB. And all organizations are being targeted by financially motivated organized crime, crime actors. And for the overwhelming majority of these hacks, it is just plain old robbery. It's just, uh, it's just financially motivated. And the key word here uh, for me is going to be organized. Do not underestimate the, this level of organization. These organizations look, smell, ta uh, taste, act, function exactly like a real business. They have engineers, they have project managers, they have financial targets, um, they have customer lists, they're not really customers, they're victims. They have engineers, they have help desk, they have square footage, they have all those things. It's just that their business, what they're doing is, uh, well, it's immoral and it's unethical, certainly, or robbing people. But it might not necessarily be illegal per se, where wherever they happen to be. If there's no legal prohibition, then there's there's no enforcement, and they know that they know exactly what they're doing. 
So I'm going to talk about some security concepts uh, like dwell time. Dwell time is the amount of time that a, uh, an attacker has free reign in an environment. So what this means is this is the amount of time between an attacker gets a toehold in your environment. Uh, they do reconnaissance and they do some form of, form of penetration. They compromise your system and they have some level of access to it. That's when they get a toehold. It's when they, you know, they pry open a window or kick open a kick open a door, so to speak. Um, and uh, the amount of time between when that happens and when we actually discover that breach is what dwell time is. This is when the bleeding starts. Uh, and uh, we need to do triage immediately. And it's critically important that we get this dwell time down to uh, as small of a slice, a sliver of time as possible. Without advanced protective technologies, this could be weeks or even months. Uh, with advanced protective technologies, we can get this down to minutes. Uh, or hours, and sometimes less. So many times it's instantaneous when we have EDR and MDR in place. A new ransomware attack uh, happens every 11 seconds. And this particular uh, statistic comes from Pfizer. Now, keep in mind this, the statistics that we have on cybersecurity, we're reasonably certain they're accurate, but they're not perfect because this isn't like violent crime or like uh, deaths per 100,000 miles and some other things because those things all get reported for sure, but uh, there's not always a reporting requirement for uh, for a ransomware attack or for any kind of cybersecurity attack. And a lot of them go unreported. So we don't always know when this is happening. We have good ideas, but a lot of times they don't get reported. Uh, and somebody asked me, well, how pervasive is this really? And I said, it's probably honestly about as pervasive as graffiti. Imagine if you were in a large city uh, I'm in Montreal right now. There happens, and there's a lot of graffiti here. Imagine if you have uh, tried to have law enforcement clean up all the graffiti in the city. It would be an untenable problem. So you're kind of stuck cleaning it up yourself, and that's where small to mid-sized businesses sit with respect, respect to cybersecurity and ransomware. The, the local government, state government, national government really just does not have the resources available to deal with this. Hasn't happened to us yet. I don't hear this much anymore, thankfully. Um, years ago, I would do a presentation. I would say, well, who doesn't think that you're going to be a victim of ransomware or cyber attack? And I think that people have come to realize that these are simple smash and grab attacks. They're completely indiscriminate. They can hit anybody at any time. Uh, just like a bolt out of the blue. It's like leaving your car in a bad neighborhood. You, it's a, just a, it could happen. So uh, average dwell time for ransomware is 23 days, according to this particular statistic. Again, that's with uh, protective technologies in place. Without those things in place, uh, it could take much longer than that. Average downtime for ransomware is 21 days. So this means when you get ransomware, and that's the average, some are more, some are less. And the less is when you have uh, business continuity and disaster recovery in place, and you have your backups, and you have incident response, and these other things. Uh, but imagine 21 days of lost revenue or lost operations right off the bat. Most small businesses cannot afford to be down for that long. And, uh, the effects of this are, are horrendous. Average cost of recovery reached $1.4 million in 2022. And there's a lot of, those numbers are accurate. I've seen them. Uh, there's many things that contribute to that. Number one, you have all the last lost revenue from the downtime. You have the cost uh, cleanup, forensics, accounting work, um, uh, lawyers. Uh, you could end up getting sued over lost data. It has a negative impact on your uh, on the image of your company. Think about when you have these fantastic breaches and big publicly traded companies that actually can affect their market cap by millions of dollars. Uh, there's reputational damage. There's uh, um, there's probably five or six different buckets where these funds are coming from uh, that uh, add up to these numbers. And for small businesses, this could put you out of business. We need to we need to stop this from happening. Increased low, uh, legislation globally, as I mentioned before today, I'm, I'm uh, presenting from Montreal, Canada, and uh, every different countries have different regulations that they have, they're having to deal with. And so depending on what you do and then who you do it for and where you do it, uh, keep an eye on any legislation which is going to impact you, whether it's uh, federal, state, local, international, uh, those those things. Cyber insurance policies are skyrocketing and not being renewed. Cyber insurance is, a, is an important subject, and we have an entire 45-minute webinar that I could do on that, uh, that we do do on that. Um, but cyber insurance is not a silver bullet. It's very complicated. And, you know, somebody yesterday here in Montreal, uh, they opined that buying cybersecurity insurance was more like buying art insurance than buying um, say car insurance or homeowners insurance. And I thought it was a great analogy because it's really a different animal. It takes a lot of consideration. Um, it's necessary, but uh, the, the premiums are going up to the point where it's, 
just not as affordable as it used to be. Uh, cybersecurity concerns. I want to talk about the small and mid-sized businesses and cyber and, and cybersec. This is the 2022 Verizon data breach investigation report. Verizon puts out this report uh, every single year. They've been doing it since 2008. So, um, you know, us kind of cyber nerds, this thing's near and dear to our heart. And we wait for this thing every year and you read the entire thing. It's usually 110, 120 pages. It gets a little dry at times. So, uh, you know, brew, brew yourself some coffee if you're going to read this thing. But uh, according to Verizon, there's four key paths leading to the compromise of your estates. And uh, I agree with them on this. Having done uh, penetration testing, white hat hacking on my own, which is when somebody hires somebody like me uh, to break into their systems and then provide a report and then tell them how to close the holes after the fact. Uh, Verizon says these uh, four, four key paths are attack vectors or credentials, phishing, exploit vulnerabilities, and botnets. And I'm going to talk about these things moment uh, briefly here. Credentials are usernames and passwords, of course, and they are easy to steal. There's a variety of technical means you could use rainbow tables, brute force attacks, uh, social engineering. There's all kinds of ways to exfiltrate usernames and passwords. Phishing, we all know what phishing is. Something like 85% uh, of the email that is traversing the globe daily on a daily basis now is uh, is garbage. And only about 15% of is actual, is real legitimate email that was intended by a human for a human. <clears throat> And the reason why uh, uh, ransomware outfits do this is because it works. This is the law of average. It's just the law of average, period. Everybody gets junk mail in, in your mailbox uh, from you know, from the post office. You go outside and there's you know a card in there for oil changes or windows or whatever it is. And the reason that marketing firms do that is because they know that it works. If you send out 100,000 or a million of those things, you might get you know a 3% conversion rate and out of that 3%. Uh, and the same exact uh, same exact thing is true of uh, of uh, phishing emails. They're they're cheap to send out. There's very little risk. So if you send out a million or ten million of them, you know that you know probably three percent of people are going to click on these things. And out of that three percent, uh, some percentage of them are going to have some unpatched vulnerability that can be exploited. And then boom, you get in there, and then the dual time starts. Uh, the next piece is exploit vulnerabilities, and Vulnerabilities, normally we think about technical vulnerabilities like missing patches, systems that are end of life, systems that are misconfigured, uh, systems that are not operating correctly. But this could also refer to uh, poorly trained people that click on phishing emails or make poor decisions that can open up our, our systems to, uh, to hackers. And the bottom piece here is botnets. And I, I'm surprised whenever I present live, I always do a show of hands, you know, who knows what a botnet is. And it's usually very low. Not many people know what a botnet is. So I'm going to explain this. Uh, a botnet is why hackers are interested in your grandmother's computer or the computer in the, in the you know, the back store of an old candy or the back room of an old candy store or something like that. So they get a toehold in, in it. They use scanning to find machines that are vulnerable. They use automation to install backdoor into it, and then eventually a human will come and look at it, and then and there's, there's nothing on this that's useful. Um, so what they do is they leave the back door in, you know, it's a, 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 a back door that reports back to what's called a command and control server. So let's say you have 10,000 or 100,000 or a million of these things, and botnets of that size do exist. Now we have something that we could use to attack a large, hardened target. So you use your command and control server to control all of your bots, and then the bots could... Uh, you know, attack a big hardened target like, um, uh, you know, General Electric or Verizon or whatever it is that you want to hit. In the military, in military parlance, this is something that we refer to as a, as a force multiplier. And oh, by the way, you could go on the dark web and you could rent botnets by the hour, like uh, like a cheap motel in a bad neighborhood for a couple of, for Bitcoin in exchange for Bitcoins or other cryptocurrency. And they do not care what you do with it. They don't care. They don't ask. You just pay. You just pay the Bitcoin. You do whatever you're going to do, and then uh, you, you're done. Uh, they're done with it. Uh, more stuff from the Verizon DBI are these are some of the security concepts from the threat report. Assets are anything that have value in a company, and in terms of cybersecurity, we normally think about things in terms, you know, data. We have data that's uh, this that's restricted, that is confidential, that's public, uh, but. It could be other things besides just that. This and really, again, anything that has value that needs to be protected by a business continuity and disaster recovery plan, cybersecurity plan. So this could be the people's computers, servers, tools, buildings, vehicles, just anything that needs to be protected from uh, a, uh, from a threat. 
um, which is our next bullet. A threat is anything that has the potential to damage an asset. And threats really fall into two basic categories, natural and then man-made. A man-made threat would be some type of a hacking thing, and a natural threat would be, you know, wildfires, seismic activity, major storms. Um, threat actors are persons or organizations carrying out a threat. The threat, the worst types of threat actors are going to be the insider threat. And uh, working in the government space, as I did for years and years, that's something that we think a lot about. You would have posters of Alder James or Robert Hansen or whatever on the walls. In the small to mid-sized business space, it's not something that we worry about too much, but uh, internal threats have the highest uh, impact. Uh, for small businesses, they have low probability. You don't normally have insider threats, but they have a very high impact if somebody internally is angry and wants to do something malicious. Uh, the next bullet here is a vulnerability, and a vulnerability is an opening or a weakness in a system, and a vulnerability could either be technical or it could be a human. Again, a vulnerability could be missing patches, misconfigured systems, missing firewall rules, things that are configured properly, uh, things that are end of life. But it could also be, again, poorly trained humans that make poor decisions that are going to open the system up um, to, to an exploit, which is our next bullet. And the exploit is the process of taking advantage of a, a vulnerability to attack. And uh, normally we're thinking about, um, you know, a virus, worm, trojan, denial of service attack, but this could also be sending phishing emails or making phone calls against social engineering. And the bottom bullet here that I have is ransomware as a service. And uh, ransomware as a service, I'd mentioned before that these outfits, these uh, threat actors that are overseas, they're organized, they look, smell, taste, and act exactly like real businesses. And what does a real business want to do? They want to increase top line revenue, right? And, and profitability. And I guarantee you that they track their financial targets like top line revenue and EBIT and these other things because they're very sophisticated. But if you want to scale, well, let's let's offer ransomware as a service where we basically build a kit out of our ransomware. It's kind of like buying a piece of furniture at Ikea. Everything comes in the box. There's instructions. Uh, there's support and there's even a phone number to call if things don't work correctly. And then they get back uh, some percentage of the revenue, and that's how they can, you know, double or triple their revenue uh, without uh, hiring anybody. It's one of the things about SaaS software as a service that scales easily, uh, and that includes ransomware, unfortunately. Top threat actor profiles from the Verizon DBIR. You may have seen some of these in the news. They get kicked around the news uh, quite a bit high uh, of Adam Conti. Um, but look on the right side of my slide here, TTPs, that's tools, techniques, and procedures, or it might be tools, tactics, and procedures. Um, between being a veteran and being an IT, I know so many acronyms, I can't even keep them all straight half the time. But um, uh, there, there are a couple of different uh, tools, techniques, and procedures, tactics, techniques, and procedures that are shared by these, these groups, initial access, execution, defense, evasion, impact. Think of... Um, and I would like to compare this to, let's say, a series of violent crimes in a major city. Uh, you know, when you send out teams of detectives and they go out and they dust for fingerprints and look for broken glass and spatters of blood, they look for a weapon and you take pictures of the victim. So imagine that you're you're responding to a crime scene and a cyber crime scene is pretty similar to that. And uh, let's say it's the same perpetrator that commits a couple of different crimes. You start to get a sense of who it was. You, you look at the reconnaissance, they might pick a particular type of vi victim, they use the same type of weapon, they attack the victim in the same way, they try to cover things up after after the fact, and uh, in the same way, in these different groups, they kind of do the same sort of thing. So when we do deep forensics and we look at the log files and then, you know, take disk images and these other things, we can get an idea of which, uh, which one of these groups is responsible for a particular hack. On average, uh, pain ransomware uh, doesn't always work. Uh, on average, 60%, of, 65 percent of data is restored after paying the ransom. And for small businesses, this really becomes a deeply personal decision. Law enforcement will always say, "Don't pay it." That you know, that's their. I differ from law enforcement on that. Law enforcement wants people to not not pay it uh, because then the revenue streams will, will dry up, and theoretically, they would stop doing it. But you know, if you're a small business say that you started your business um, or that, you know, maybe it's a second generation business, your parents started it and it's the functional equivalent of your 401k, you're putting your kids through college. Your business is, it's your lifeblood, it's your nest egg, it's everything. And now you're not operating and you're hemorrhaging cash and you have this threat over your head. And they're, so in your head, you are thinking to yourself, well, I could pay this, you know, amount of money and then I have a 75% chance of getting my data back or I'm gonna go out of business. This now becomes a deeply 
personal decision based on your own tolerance for risk, finances, effect on your employees, effect on your customers, and, and a million other things are going to be different from every other business. It's a very complicated decision. But our real goal is to keep this from happening, and we're going to get into that uh, in a couple of minutes here. When we start talking about advanced protect technologies, we want to stop these things from happening to begin with. We do not want this happening to a small business. It is a disaster. Uh, the average approximate cost to organizations to rectify the impacts of the most recent ransomware attack, they roughly, they roughly doubled from 2020 to 2021, and they've gone up even more from there. And this is when we factor in uh, uh, fines, legal fees, forensics. Uh, and these, uh, the ransomware, the, the threat actors, they are putting pressure on businesses on purpose. They do this on purpose. They uh, want to put as much pressure as they can on you in order to make you pay. But they've also gotten way more sophisticated at figuring out what they are going to uh, demand. It used to be they would make unreasonable demands of small businesses and then laughable demands of big businesses. So, you know, you hack IBM and then you demand, you know, uh, $10,000 from there. Kind of like, well, that's kind of a joke. Well, we, you know, we have that in the couch. But if you, you know, you you hack into a, um, you know, a plumbing store somewhere in Pennsylvania, you're demanding a million dollars, it's a different animal. But once they get the toehold in, they like to do research and then try and figure out roughly what the size of the business is and get some idea of what top line revenue might be. And then they try to size their demands based on the size of the business instead of just taking, um, throwing junk at the wall and seeing what sticks. Everyday challenges for nonprofits and small to mid-sized businesses uh, cybersecurity, confusion, IT versus business challenges. All small businesses have a lot of balls in the air at any given time. An old friend of mine that I grew up with and who's an IT engineer, he now runs a brewery and uh, he has 50 employees and he has three or four different buildings. And there's somebody like that. And a lot of small businesses, you have all these different balls in the air at any given time. You, you have your employees, your payroll, you have operations, you have maintenance on your buildings, you have to deal with taxes, regulations. And oh, by the way, now we're going to take this other ball called cybersecurity and we're going to throw it in there. And if you drop that one, you're going to be in big trouble. So it's hard for small businesses to, to juggle all this. And that's why it's so important for them uh, to have partnerships with, with CIS and, you know, in turn, ConnectWise to, uh, to help leverage deep expertise and automation in order to solve these problems so that you can sleep at night. It, it's, it's just hard to manage cybersecurity with all these other things that you, that you have to do especially when the other things that you have to do are legally compulsory, regulatory, compul regulatorily, uh, regular, whether uh, for us, imposed through regulations, statutes, like say the National Electric Code or ADA or ED, uh, EEOE or food codes, cybersecurity for most businesses is going to be discretionary. It's not imposed on you, so you have to choose to do it. Not all the time. Um, that's going to be something to act your, ask, ask, uh, ask your legal defense about you may, may have contract for legal obligations depending on what kind of data you have and where you are complexity of shifting to remote for, workforce people are just all over the place anymore COVID really accelerated that and it has made zero trust architecture and vpn and some of these other technologies just so much more important that's another thing that needs to be managed poor communications between organizations and their managed it service providers um cyber security the threat landscape is very tumultuous and it's like every other day you wake up and there's some crazy thing in the news that you can't believe is happening when you read all the feeds. So because it's so tumultuous and things can pivot 90 degrees one way or the other at any given second, it's important to have be having regular ongoing conversations about security with your managed IT service providers. This, you know, at least a touch base once a month, some type of quarterly security review, um, annual, annual vulnerability assessments and re-ups, technology refreshes. Poor cybersecurity skill sets within the organization. There aren't enough people in this career field, which is great for, um, you know, great for those of us who work in it. But what I've kind of noticed, it's been my observation, is that uh, the big tech companies, especially the ones on the coasts, they're no longer shy about hiring people that live in, you know, Iowa or, you know, uh, you know, Idaho or just whatever. I live in rural Pennsylvania and I work for a, for a, a company with 3,000 people, a $3 billion company. Uh, and what's happening is it's driving the cost of the talent that's not on the coasts up. And it's kind of driving the cost that in, in you know, coastal areas down a little bit. But uh, I think it's making it harder for small businesses to find and retain this talent because it's driving the cost of it up. Ad hoc business continuity and disaster recovery efforts. The time that to have business continuity and disaster recovery efforts is now 
because disasters happen, cybersecurity disasters happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And uh, what I always tell people, if you're operating an information system 24-7, 24 7, 24 7 365, which most organizations do, that's like buying a house on the coast of Florida or in Galveston, Texas, or something like that. You know what's going to happen. Eventually, you're going to have some kind of a big storm. And we hope that it's going to be, um, you know, a tropical storm or maybe a Cat 1. But what if it's a Cat 3 or a Cat 5? like what hit Fort Myers last year. It's just a matter of time and you need to be prepared for this before it happens and not wait until it happens. And again, if you were buying a house on the coast of Florida, you would have plywood to put over the windows and you have jugs of water and you would have some freeze dried food and flashlights and maps and coats and blankets and first aid and these other things. That's all an incident response plan. And it's not business continuity necessarily, but it's the same kind of thing. And you need all, to have all the same planning for your business. Take a look, look at the risks and then plan for them. Uh, increased cost to respond and recover from an incident. We covered that a couple times already, but the cost of uh, cleaning these things keeps going up and up. Uh, I have, um, I sent a copy of the slides in PDF to CIS, and if you'd like a copy of them, just ask. And you can follow this QR code if you'd like more information about some of these threat actors that are targeting uh, businesses here, then uh, you can go ahead and take a look at that. We're only human. A person is involved at the center of most security events. And, uh, According to this statistic, 82% of breaches result from human elements. And in my opinion, that's probably accurate. And again, I say that from having done penetration testing or white hat hacking, what we find is most of the time, um, the internet facing systems are reasonably well hardened and uh, uh, they can be difficult to get through. So we normally move on to social engineering, making phone calls, uh, phishing, sending snail mail, whatever it takes. And then ultimately we trick a human into making some type of a poor decision, which allows us to get into the systems. 66% of breaches involve phishing or stolen credentials. As I mentioned earlier, stealing usernames and passwords is easy to do. Uh, there are already massive databases filled with billions of passwords, literally billions of passwords. And we could run those through algorithms and then turn them into what we call a rainbow table, which is a big index of password hashes. And then we could use that to match passwords like instantly um, once we steal a password database. Um, this is why it's so important to have multi-factor authentication, which we're going to get into momentarily here. 2.9% um, of employees may click on phishing emails. So this probably should say will click on phishing emails, and it's probably a little bit higher than that. But what I, and again, I had mentioned earlier, this is just simply the law of averages. If you send out enough phishing emails, then some percentage of people are going to click on them, and it is about 3%. Um, with all of that said, uh, organizations can significantly reduce their attack surface by focusing on controls to mitigate the likelihood. So there are a couple of things that you could do that would dramatically reduce uh, the impact of one of these attacks. And the first thing is going to be adopt email filters and provide user training to combat phishing attacks. And when I say email filter, what I mean is uh, when you send an email, I don't want the email going directly from Bob. Let's say Bob is sending an email to Alice. I don't want the email going directly from Bob to Alice. I want it going from Bob uh, to an intermediary warehouse that's in the cloud that can scan the email, cross-reference it, look at the payload, and then determine whether it's a go, no go, whether it's malicious or not. And uh, this technology is available to you through CIS. There's a number of different options. It's almost completely transparent to the user. You won't even realize that it's there, and it drastically reduces the amount of junk that you save and it, uh, you, that you uh, that you receive, and it drastically re uh, reduces uh, uh, the amount of attacks you're going to receive. And then the second piece of this is user training. There's a bunch of different vendors that offer user training. So you can talk to CIS and find out what user training is uh, going to be a best fit for you. Um, and it, it should also have uh, phishing training in there. Practice good password hygiene. I, I kind of think at this point, telling people about password hygiene is like telling them to brush their teeth or wash their hands. I think everybody knows what that means and I won't spend any time on it. And then use multi-factor authentication everywhere that you can. Uh, MFA is extremely important. That is the the best uh, the best first defense against stolen usernames and passwords is multi-factor authentication. And again, there's many different options that are available, and they're they're no longer expensive or complicated. I'm a little bit behind on my slides here, so I'm going to try talking a little bit quicker. I already covered this. Most data thieves are organized professional criminals deliberately trying to steal information that can turn into financial gain. I'll talk to the second bullet here. 40% of ransomware incidents involve desktop sharing software, RDP. It's extremely critical to not expose this to the internet unless it's absolutely necessary. And uh, we're going to talk about a cybersecurity assessment towards the end of the assessment here. 
and a CIS could tell to tell you if you have this. When I do assessments and I would find already peaceful, uh, 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 exposed to the internet, I feel like I'm watching one of my kids ride a motorcycle without a helmet on or watching somebody ride around without a seatbelt on. It drives me crazy because it's a poor practice and, it, and it's just dangerous. Um, now, unlike riding around without a seatbelt or a helmet, there are use cases for this. So if it's necessary, then we could put compensating and mitigating controls in, in place to drastically reduce the probability of, a, uh, of an intrusion. So um, now that I've kind of spent all this time scaring everybody, we're going to talk about SIEM and MDR a little bit. SIEM, uh, security information, event monitoring, and MDR, which is managed detection and response, which is an extension of EDR, which is an uh, endpoint detection and response. So a SIEM is security information event monitoring, and, and it works by collecting log and event data generated by organization systems, router switches, servers, IoT, laptops, workstations, could be VoIP phones, um, cameras, really, there's all kinds of stuff that generates logs. And uh, probably 15 or 20 years ago, uh, SIEM started to, to appear in the enterprise environment because we knew that we needed to do something with all these logs. There's hundreds of thousands or millions of entries per day in an enterprise environment. And in the small to mid-sized business space, the logs tend to be just ignored, which is unfortunate. Um, and uh, SIEM is one of these technologies that we could use to get that dwell time way down to get it from... Uh, from days down to uh, down to minutes. Uh, and the reason you would need a SIEM is for auditing and compliance requirements, for example, depending on what you do and then who you do it for, uh, you might have contractual requirements. If you operate in finance or the defense space or the education space, you might have some type of requirements. Some insurance companies require SIEM. Full visibility of everything happening in, in the network dramatically decreases the time that it takes to identify threats. This is definitely true. Again, uh, the, it collapses that dwell time first. And uh, look at um, my board in the bottom right here, detailed forensics analysis in the event of major security breaches. Do you remember my earlier slide about TTPs when I was talking about broken glass, fingerprints, uh, and, and splatters of blood and all that stuff? And of course, those are analogies, but uh, the team will pick up these things. And not only does it pick those, pick those events up, uh, these security relevant events that are happening on your network, it offloads them into a cloud and then warehouses them so that when the threat actors clean up this, the logs after the fact, which they always do, they either sanitize them or they delete them so you can't figure out what's going on. We have a copy of all that forensic evidence uh, in the cloud so that we could do that. Um, we could do that for uh, forensics, even though that they deleted everything. Um, here's the problem with SIEM though. Is, uh, SIEM is uh, kind of an abstract technology and it's hard to explain to people that are not technical. And I have an entire slideshow on that. So engineers, you know, which I, I'm an engineer, I was anyway. You know, SIEM is a critical protective and detective technology. We can sit there and talk about how great SIEM is all day long. And then the CFO, and by CFO, I mean the decision maker, the person that's actually paying for the SIEM, you know, signing that check every month or signing the contract. But I don't get this. What does this even do? And that's not the, you know, somebody might be an accountant or, um, you know, have legal training or whatever, but SIEM is it's kind of an abstract concept and it's hard to explain. And then as far as the users go, they say, stop cooking fish in the microwave. And the reason I make this little joke here is because it doesn't affect uh, the users at all. It doesn't make your computer faster. It doesn't make it slower. There's no blinking lights. There's no extra features. There's no anything. It doesn't do anything for the user one way or the other. It does protect them from ransomware attacks. How a SIEM works, uh, this slide gives us a notional idea, but uh, the SIEM is located in the cloud. Uh, and it can adjust logs from workstation and servers, network devices, sensors, web applications, uh, work from home employees, cloud integrations, and then adjust all these things into uh, the perch instance in cloud. And then it will distill these logs down into something that is human readable. And then it can up channel uh, events that humans need to know about uh, to, to a human for them to uh, take respond, uh, to respond to that. Now, SIEM is a very different technology than EDR and MDR. SIEM is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like a smoke detector. It doesn't actually, it can tell you that there's smoke or fire, but it doesn't, uh, it won't actually do anything about it. But EDR and MDR can, uh, they can actually put a fire out on the spot. Uh, EDR and MDR, EDR is endpoint detection and response and MDR is managed detection and response. And these are basically, um, for lack of a better description, next generation antivirus. And old school antivirus is just kind of outdated and outmoded. And um, old school antivirus is basically a simple pattern matching technology. And that means once you have a piece of malicious logic that has been set free in the wild and it starts affecting computers, we can fingerprint it or hash it 
And then you know what the hash is and you put it into a database. And then when you get an exact match in the future, again, it's like fingerprint. Then we know that that's a piece of malicious logic. You get a go, no go. It'll quarantine it. And that's mostly how AV works. Uh, EDR and MDR, they have that uh, ability built into it, but they do uh, they do way more than this. Uh, EDR and MDR can go both do real-time file analysis, active code analysis. They could actually take a look at the payload and then look for strings that appear to be malicious. So not only does EDR and MDR have pattern uh, matching technology, it can do that, but it has pattern recognition technology. So if it looks like a piece of logic, a piece of malicious logic, it, it knows that it's something malicious. And the best example I could think of for the use case for EDR, if you remember a number, a couple of years ago, we had that WannaCry attack, and man, that was one nasty bug. WannaCry was based on Eternal Blue, which was built by the NSA, National Security Agency. So this was a state weapons grade piece of malicious logic. And the North Koreans took this thing and wrapped it in a worm. And a worm is something that propagates from system to system without human interaction. And then they attached a uh, ransomware function to it. And uh, it could have made an absolute boatload of money if they'd executed it correctly. But I guess the North Koreans are not very good capitalists. But uh, it, it spread like wildfire, but it didn't make a ton of money. And they, they released this thing on Europe first. And uh, computers that had endpoints that had antivirus were crushed by this thing. because uh, Endpoints which had EDR, endpoint detection and response, they crushed this thing on day one. Despite the fact that it was designed by the NSA and they'd never seen it before, they looked at what Eternal Blue was doing um, in terms of behavior, uh, launching PowerShell, doing things with the registry, sending out certain types of traffic, and it decided it was malicious and it crushed the thing on the spot. And not only that, EDR and MDR, they also have undo features built into them, literally undo features. Uh, I bet you everybody that's listening here is at some point accidentally deleted an entire paragraph out of Word or an entire column out of Excel. And what do you do nowadays? Uh, Tim, remember we used to hit control S every five seconds, right? We don't do that anymore. Um, but uh, now you just hit the undo, the undo, the undo feature, and then your data comes back. And EDR and MDR can do this. Uh, and now there's a slight difference between EDR and MDR, but it's a very important difference. EDR is uh, mostly automated. Uh, MDR is EDR plus a human watching it, a uh, so security operations center. And we want to, when we do our security risk assessment and we identify assets that we have zero tolerance for them being down, we want to put MDR on those so that, uh, think of like NORAD, uh, humans watching screens for incoming threats so that a human can make a decision on the spot when we see a, a threat that uh, is, is, is imminent. Uh, cyber research unit, I have a slide here on ConnectWise of cyber research units. Uh, we we have hundreds, ultimately have hundreds of thousands of endpoints under management through our partners. And they're, the over, overwhelming majority of them are small to mid-sized businesses. So I think that ConnectWise probably knows. ConnectWise and our partners like CIS, we know more about the small to mid-sized businesses than probably any other company because that's primarily who we serve. Um, I'm a little bit behind, so I'm going to skip through my slides here. But we're going to talk about security and risk assessments because you don't know what you don't know. And that's, just, that's the very next step that uh, we, need, we need to take on our cybersecurity journey here. And uh, this slide here, I'm showing you what we consider to be the components of a well-designed cybersecurity solution. And ConnectWise has all of these things, CIS has all of these things, Lockheed Martin and Wells Fargo have all of these things, but small and mid-sized businesses don't. Uh, SIEM and log management, advanced endpoint detection and response, DNS protection, mobile, di mobile device security, cyber insurance. But the first thing on this step on the security journey is a security assessment. We need to, we need to know, well, where are we today? Where should we be? Um, what's it going to take to get us from here to there? And how do we do that in a way that does not have an unacceptable negative uh, um, impact on operations or finance? Uh, and Tim, I have, these are your slides now. Right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to you. Thank you. Okay. So we've taken, uh, this is actually a snapshot of one of the pages on our website where you can do a self-assessment. And so uh, kind of explaining the the basics of this, if you if you look over on the left hand side, you see foundational, proactive, and advanced. Uh, we consider everything that applies to you in the red section, foundational, as the base foundation. If you don't have everything in here that applies to you, then your your foundation is bad, and even putting some of the higher up pieces in place won't be as good because you don't have the foundation. Now, some things may not be 
be uh, necessary. If you don't have any mobile devices, obviously, then a mobile device management tool isn't necessary. But having all of these pieces in place is critically important. Uh, we're running behind time, so I, I won't explain each one of them. But if you go to the website, you'll be able to uh, click. And can you go to the next slide? You may be able to click. And when you click on one of the cells, it's going to pop up questions for you to answer. And depending on how you answer them, you get a, a different uh, score. And so you can see someone has answered enough. Every place there's a green check mark, someone has answered a question. They may have answered it where I don't have that, and therefore your, your score is lower. But for example, we're looking at the zero trust piece. And uh, we're, if you think you have it, but you don't know to what extent, that's good. But if you know you have clearly defined and, any, and enhanced and enforced rather acceptable use policies, which is a critical part of zero trust. Who can use what and how can they use it has to be defined to know how to limit what they can use. Um, and then if you have isolated access on top of that, then these things build on each other. And so as you look through each one of these pieces, they, they are a foundation. And can you go back one slide so I can see the whole piece, but they, they work as a foundation to minimizing risk. If you don't have MFA and you have RDP exposed, you lack a lot of zero trust and you are at risk of somebody getting in. And when they get in, they can do a tremendous amount of damage. And so I think the, the most intimidating part of this of cybersecurity is the number of pieces of things that you have to look at to truly be secure. The number of different things that you have to monitor, for example, if you have SaaS applications hosted, how do you monitor their logs and how do you how do you keep that safe? Do you have personally identifiable information? How are you monitoring your land? Do you monitor your staff? Um, you, I think I heard it's 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 less risky inside of a small business environment to monitor the staff, but I've had instances where staff were stealing and stealing a lot of money and knowing what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, sending out an email with resumes attached, for example, or sending out emails that has your uh, financial statements on them, different things like that, that uh, this type of monitoring can can happen. But the, the key is, is the layers of protection. And so getting the foundation right is absolutely critical. If you don't do that, you're at high risk and you are going to get hacked at some point. Proactive, if you've got a lot of value in your digital environment, in your operational environment, relying on your computer systems, you need a lot of the proactive pieces. Um, the advanced doesn't really necessarily apply to all businesses like NIST. Maybe it's required, maybe it's not. But even though you may not follow the, the protocols inside of NIST, you still need to have your internal cybersecurity policies define so you know if you're following them or not and you need to follow up and make sure. Otherwise, you have what's called unmanaged risk and that's a bad thing in business in general. Tim, I love the penetration testing at the top. It reminds me, I used to field calls from um, people that would ask for a penetration test and then after a brief discussion, I'd find out, well, you don't have all this other stuff. I'd love to sell you a penetration test. But you have to do all this, other, <laughs> all this other stuff first, then we'll do it. That's yeah. right. If you, if you don't have all these things in place down here, all the penetration test is going to tell you is go put these things in place down here. So yeah, we the, kind of, the penetration test will last 10 minutes, right, Tim? <laughs> that's right. You, you, you failed. And so um, if you want to go to the website, we've got a place. We'll show you another slide in a little bit about about how to get to the website. You can take the test. It'll send you an email back with your, your results on there. Um, if you'd like to uh, talk with me about, or one of my people about uh, how to fill out the, the questionnaire, how, what, what do the results mean? What, what should your next steps be? And then if you, if you from there, you want to schedule a, a more uh, professional third-party driven uh, vulnerability assessment, we can facilitate that for you as well. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't implore people to do this enough. You know, I mean, it's, uh, I just turned 50 and when you turn 50, you go to the doctor and they do certain tests, right? <laughs> right. It's, it's kind of like that. It's, it's information that you really need in order to make good decisions about risk, right? Whether it's health or cyber risk, but yeah, this is, uh, every small business should do this for, for sure, because you just don't know what you Absolutely. don't know. 
And if we find out they have some type of a gaping hole that's open that's waiting to be exploited, again, this is like, you know, I've just driven my car to a bad neighborhood in a major city, and then I've left my phone on the seat and left the, the door unlocked. It's, we need to, we need to, we need right. to find it so that we can secure that. Well, and I, and I agree with you. On our managed service customers, once a quarter, we do a vulnerability test, even though we're managing all the tools. Uh, the security landscape is a moving target. It, people will use your systems every day. They change things. They click on things. They You get new employees in. If they follow their training or not, all, all those types of things. You get new applications. How do you secure them? And so we, we do this once a quarter on every one of our customers. And from there, we have a remediation list that is targeted for future efforts through the managed security uh, process to constantly know where our risk is. Very few companies have 100% of the risk, risk mitigated. But knowing where it is and knowing the decisions you make so that you can raise that percentage over time is extremely important to staying ahead of the bad actors. Yeah, and, and security isn't something that you pay for. It's something that you do. It's, uh, it's an organizational effort. And trying to become secure just by paying for it would be like writing a check to a fitness trainer and expecting six pack abs. It doesn't work. Out. You you you've got to get in the gym. You just have to. That's right. That's right. All right, Peter. Uh, next slide. I think uh, I think we're fit. okay. So, you do have another. Okay. Uh, hey, whoop. whoop! One back. So. Uh, if you'd like a, a free vulnerability assessment, we can do that. It doesn't include any engineering time, but it does include going through the the uh, page that we just looked at and digging more in more detail about what you do know, what you don't know, what the risks are, so that you can. It's it's an educational process. Okay, and with that, okay. I will stop I the share. I'll see if we have any. Do we have anything in the Q and A that we want to talk about? Uh, nothing, nothing in the Q and A. Um, I know that we're bumping up against the edge of time here. Um, I did go ahead and drop the link to the risk assessment tool that's on the website. Um, so that's there in the chat. And then also uh, in our follow up messaging, look out for um, you know those contact uh, emails, those contact links to be able to follow up uh, with Tim if you have additional questions. Uh, you know, once you <laughs> that always happens once you get offline, you're like, you know what, I did have a question. Um, so look out for that correspondence uh, from the CIS team that'll have all those links and um, email addresses, phone numbers. Uh, for you to respond. Um, but in the meantime, <clears throat> you know, I'd like to definitely thank Tim and Jason for putting this together. Um, I know the CIS team and, and you uh, spearheading that uh, really spent some time to put that tool together. Um, you know, the, the pyramid. Yeah, it is pretty impressive, right? The pyramid looks good, Tim. I'm impressed with it, really. Right. And you've got everything in a nice graphic. I think it's... Uh, right. well, um, and it's interactive to get your score. I, I think the report coming back really gives people something they can work on inside of their organization for what are we missing. Yeah. Because and that, that, so yeah. yeah. That visual representation, I think, is really helpful, you know, for folks that are not in the, in the industry and not really familiar that's with right. everything it takes, you know, to to help a business become more secure and, and better protect themselves against these risks. Sometimes it can be a little abstract uh, because we're not, uh, you know, in the industry and familiar with all these different aspects. That tool really helps put things into perspective and, and you know, kind of tries to take out the engineering double speak. Yeah. Yeah. So kudos to you and and the team that put that together. I know we've been working hard these last couple of months to, <laughs> to, to get it together and, and have it, you know, live on the website so that that folks can kind of get in and play around in there. And, and let me warn you, you can go down a rabbit hole once you get in and you start clicking on things and the score starts adjusting and you're like, okay, well, how do I move it up into the yellow? And what do I need, you know, to get, get my business up into the green? Um, so definitely thank you for, for putting that together and, 
uh, putting this presentation together. And this is part of a series um, for those who are here today, we, you know, do this on a regular basis with the team from CIS, uh, you know, bringing in industry experts uh, to get the information out there and to educate businesses about what's happening and, you know, what are solutions to, to better protect yourself and better protect your customers. So thank you. Thank you, Tim, for putting this together. Thank you, Jason, for putting this together and, and uh, offering your insights and your experience. So thanks for having me. Really appreciate. Um, but if no one has any questions, um, I am going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, and look out, like I said, look out for that follow up email. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye. -bye.